After tonight, the Mets will be sailing away from South Florida, their last game in Miami this season. Before they leave, they've got one more to play at Marlins Park, which yesterday, Juan Lagares made his own personal playground. He had a big day doing things that nobody had done for the Mets since a guy named Reyes. At Marlins Park in Miami, Florida, the New York Mets play the Miami Marlins. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to Miami. I'm Gary Cohen, along with Ron Darling. Mets play the rubber game of their three-game series against Miami. 23 games to go in the regular season, and one of the things the Mets are trying to figure out for next year is who their leadoff hitter is going to be. Yesterday, Juan Lagares staked his claim. Well, there's been a lot of experimentation, not only in the pitching staff, but the everyday players. And what they're trying to find out, a couple of things. Can Lagares hit as well as he feels? Yesterday, that was a moot point as he went four for four, was on base five times. Can he use his speed a little more and steal some bases? Well, he's been running wild the past three games and has been great. Yesterday, he scored three runs. So he did everything you want a leadoff hitter to do. Can he do it consistently over an entire season? We're going to have to see. But he's one of the bright young stars of the Mets. Four hits, two RBIs, two stolen bases. No Met player had done that since Jose Reyes did. And with Lagares, you look at his leadoff numbers. If he can do that, 344 on base percentage, you have to figure out that would play. Well, there's no one else uh, really on the roster that you can lead off. We tried with Granderson earlier when he had his best uh, game going, but really Ligaris is the guy that I think you're going to look to in the future. Now, Ligaris had a huge day yesterday, but so did David Wright, and it had been a long time in coming. The Mets captain has gone 84 plate appearances without an extra base hit. Well, Gary, we can talk to a blue in the face about leadoff hitters and this or that, but unless your best players play their best, then David Wright and Granderson are two guys that are going to have to do much better. David last night, great sign. Driving the ball to right field, driving the ball over the center fielder's head and the right fielder's head. Those two doubles, very important to see if David can provide some kind of power here in September. Mets have scored six or more runs, three straight games. First time they've done that this year. They'll try and keep the good times rolling tonight. We'll check out the pitchers for tonight's game when we come back to Miami. Ball on SNY is brought to you by Toyota. See where Toyota takes you. Test drive one at your Toyota dealer. Toyota, let's go places. 
by City. City cards can get you in on the action and closer to the game with access to special benefits at City Field this season. Visit Mets.com slash City to learn more. And by Geico, 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit Geico.com for a free rate quote. You can follow every Mets game on MLB.com at bat on your favorite mobile phone or tablet. Get live look-ins, instant replays, scores, stats, audio, free MLB.tv game of the day, and more. Download on the App Store or visit Mets.com today. Jacob DeGrom returns to the scene of his first big league win as he tries to continue his candidacy for National League Rookie of the Year. Well, it's interesting. You say, um, saw him and Matt Dendecker had a lot of family in the clubhouse today. Two Florida boys. And on the other side, the New York native, Tom Kohler, will pitch against the Mets. He's been... Uh, He's pitched great against the Mets without a lot of personal success. Well, he's pitched well, too, at this ballpark. He's got six wins. That's tied for Henderson Alvarez at this park. His ERA is 2.69 in this ballpark. Kohler's the guy. Keeps the ball down. Gets a lot of ground balls. So it's DeGrom for the Mets. Kohler for the Marlins. Mets last game in Miami this year. First pitch coming up from Marlins Park. And no words are necessary. It's as timeless as it gets right there. Florida sunset. Palm trees waving. <laughs> just spectacular. You just want, you want to grab a chaise lounge and just enjoy the moment. <laughs> timeless. <laughs> Tom Kohler taking the mound for the Marlins. Kohler's got a 1 point. A 2.69 ERA at home this year. He has been terrific in this ballpark. Roof closed for the third straight day on another warm and humid South Florida day. Here's your Geico starting lineup day off for Curtis Granderson, who's really been struggling. His seventh 0 for 17 streak of the season. 
Matt Dendecker moves up to the two hole. Kirk Neuenheis gets a start at right. Wilmer Flores also a day off as Ruben Tejada gets a spot start at shortstop. Well, Tom Cole, the new Rochelle and native, 41 starts in the major leagues. He's 14 and 20, but he's pitched much better than his record of 9 and 9 so far this year. Defensively behind Tom and this evening's game in the outfield, the great young outfield, the Coors Light defense, Christian Yelich, Marcelo Zuna, and Giancarlo Stanton, McGee, Echeverria, Solano, and Garrett Jones at first base, and Salto Lamacchia doing the catching. It's amazing we can fit all those letters into that graphic. They, they have the longest names, don't they? The Marlins. Got to go with the very small fonts in this game. Juan Lagares leads off for the Mets off his huge day yesterday, and the first pitch from Kohler is fouled back, and we're underway. We mentioned that Lagares had done something that only Jose Reyes had done before. Four hits, two RBIs, two stolen bases. Reyes did it against the Dodgers in a game in 2005. No other Met has ever done that in a single game. Ball and a strike to Lagares, who's five for nine in this series. This is the seventh straight game now that he's batting leadoff. One and two to Lagares. We were talking during the open about seeing whether Lagares can be a leadoff hitter. I, I guess the question is, how big a sample do you need before you know? Well, it's it's a hard call because you know, judging not only right now but also September games, it's always hard to dis, um, make decisions in September. Uh, but to me, you know, 35 to 50 games in there is where you see if he can. You know, have that on base percentage around 350 or better. Well, certainly appears as though he's going to get a full trial through September. Matt Dendecker, who also profiles as a leadoff hitter, is on deck. 2 2 from Kohler, and it's up and inside. The, the difference between Ligaris and Dendecker right now is you know that Ligaris is going to be your center fielder next year. You don't know for sure if, if Dendecker is going to be part of your everyday lineup. 3 2 from Kohler, and Lagaris pounds one into the ground a foul ball. You know, the one thing I would like to see from Lagaris, and, and you know, it's a, it's a fine line because you don't want to take away any of his aggressiveness, is if he starts walking once in a while, too, that's going to help that on base percentage. His eye gets a little better at the plate. Drew a walk in yesterday's game, just his 17th of the season. Again, the 3 2, and he hits one up the middle, and he's got himself another base hit. So after a four for four night last night, Lagares starts this game with a base hit. Probably on that other side in the Marlins bench, you're probably saying, I thought this guy was all field, no hit. He's been unbelievable the last two nights. And doing what a lot of the Mets hitters did last night, just working that middle of the field. Now he's a threat on the bases. Well, he's stolen five bases in the last five games, including two yesterday. We'll see how quickly he is allowed to run here. And that was uh, that was something we talked about during the game yesterday, the fact that the Mets have been giving Ligaris must steal signs and not letting him just green light it on his own. Here's Dendecker, and he fouls off the first pitch fastball. You know, the interesting thing there, so Dendecker being aggressive on that first pitch, but you'd like the second place hitter to maybe take a pitch, allow Ligaris to steal, and that one right off the mask of Salta Lamacchia. Well, he's stolen a base in three straight games. Not even Eric Young has done that this year. Kohler's given up nine steals this year in 13 tries. And he misses up and away to Dendecker, one and one. Dendecker's having a good series, three for seven. In fact, uh, you go back to the Phillies series that preceded this, now six for his last 15. David Wright waiting on deck. Mets scored six runs in the final game of the series against the Phillies, six in a loss on Monday, and then eight last night, first time. In a couple of seasons, they've had three straight games of six or more. Got to go back to September of 2012, the last time that happened. Well, interesting with the Granderson out of the lineup tonight, you get to see all three young outfielders out there. One and one to Den Decker. And that lines one down the right field line. That's down for an extra base hit. Lagaris on his way to third as Stanton peels it off the wall. Lagaris will hold it third. Dendecker in at second with a double, and the Mets are in business. Second and third, and nobody out. Well, this was that short stroke we saw when he first came back from Vegas. Takes that changeup away and laces it down that right field line. Hit so hard that Stanton couldn't get an angle on it. 
Now the Mets have beaten Stanton to the line with several balls in this series. Herrera on Monday, Wright yesterday, and now Dendecker. We've uh, seen the tendency of the Marlins outfielders to play rather shallow. So now Wright, who had his uh, most encouraging day in weeks yesterday. See the defense is going to be back, of course, this early in the game. Davis driven in six runs in the last three games. Second and third, nobody out, and the first pitch curveball in for a strike. Right with consecutive multiple RBI games for the first time this season. Now has 62 runs driven in for the year, and he takes that one foul down the right side. 0 and 2. Interesting. Here, this pitch is supposed to be away. Runs right back over the middle of the plate, but just a little too firm for David to catch up to it. You see his numbers against Kohler. Kohler's been a hard luck pitcher against the Mets. Lifetime 11 appearances, eight starts, one and three, despite a 2.68 ERA. Mets trying to cash early for a second and third, and nobody out. And the slider off the plate, one and two. Well, David got himself going. The last few days taking the ball up the middle and then yesterday drove a couple of balls to center and to right. And he foul tips that salt to Lamacchia holds it and that's the first out of the night. Well, that's a good play by salt Lamacchia just off the end of Wright's bat and able to pick that up right before the dirt. So Wright unable to get a run in and now it's due to. Lucas two for eight in this series. 26 home runs 77 RBIs both in the top 10 in the league. But just two for 17 in his career against Tom Kohler. Marlins keep the infield back. And shifted but not over shifted. And the curve ball drilled foul. And the ball boy has made several marvelous plays in this series. That one a little too hot for him to handle. But he's fearless. I mean, he goes after it. You can see the infield. You're talking really about it. Chavaria, shortstop, was playing right behind the bag instead of shifted over. There he is. Lefty. Well, we saw it do to get a hit yesterday just to the right of second base where a lot of teams will play their shortstop, but the Marlins have not had that overshift throughout the series. He's had two hits in the series, both there. Guy is at third, Den Decker at second, and one out. And Duda bounces that one foul on the changeup. And Kohler, who got ahead on right and struck him out, now ahead on Duda in another spot where he needs a strikeout for Kohler, who's not really a strikeout pitcher. Tom Kohler, now 28 years old, 18th round pick in 08 out of Stony Brook. Ahead on Duda 0 and 2, and he comes to his feet 1 and 2. It's the one thing that Kohler does probably better than anyone on that Marlins team. He will pitch both right handers and left handers inside. He's fearless in that way. Are you, are you born in the Bronx? Yeah, a little fearless. Raised in New Rochelle, does that negate <laughs> <Temper> some? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the 1 2. Off the corner with a fastball. Kohler thought he might get it, but looked outside. Mike Winters, the crew chief, calling the balls and strikes tonight. Fastball away, tried to dart that outside corner. Could have been called. Now two and two to Lucas with Darno on deck. That scored two runs in the first inning in last night's game against Brad Penny, who lasted just three innings. The, the Marlins have had to go to their bullpen early each of the first two games of this series. And they could really use a, a long start out of Kohler tonight. And Duda fouls it off. Henderson Alvarez had to leave with an oblique injury in the third inning on Monday. And then uh, Penny, who was ineffective, left for a pinch hitter after three innings last night. See Duda's face right there. Remember in the beginning of the season he was missing a lot of those pitches and he went through that stretch where he didn't miss any. He's missed a couple of pitches in this at bat. Brett Penny. The once and now once again Marlin. 2-2. Tries to hold up. Did he go? He went around. Strike three. 
So Kohler with back-to-back -back strikeouts after the Mets had second and third and nobody out. Well, it's almost automatic now. Anytime the hitter makes any kind of offer, it's usually called a swing. Good block by Saltalamacchio. So the Mets trying to avoid bypassing a golden first inning opportunity. It's left to Travis Darno with two out. Travis five for eight in this series up to 237 for the year. Tied for the lead among National League rookies with 12 home runs most ever by a Mets rookie catcher. And he takes just off the plate ball one. It's one thing we noticed that due to strikeout all year Gary is that they are being very I think too aggressive in calling that half swing a strike. I'm not sure that was even a half. That <laughs> might have been a quarter of a swing. Saltalamake knocks down the curveball and it's 2 and 0. Lagaris at 30 led off with a base hit up the middle. Dendecker followed with a double to right. Second and third and nobody out but right and due to have fanned. Now Kohler behind on Darno 2 0 with Kirk Newenheis on deck. And Travis with a good cut of the fastball fouls it back 2 1. Newenheis getting the start in right field tonight. Curtis Granderson another day off. He's at the final game of the Phillies series, sitting again in today's game, just unable to get anything going. And the Mets will get a look at New and Heist instead. Terry Collins insisting that Granderson is going to play most of the time the rest of the way. Well, I'm a big believer in. Put the team out there that gives you the best chance to win. Curtis right now is in a slump. Two and two to Darno. Outside. Well, there are so many facets to that, right? Because you know you're in September. You're not in the race. You're playing for the future. Well, Curtis Granderson's part of your future. You got three more years with him at big money. I mean, you would think it would be beneficial trying to get him going before the year's over. But at the same time, he'd like to look at Newenheis and see if he's part of your future. So it's hard. That's strike three called, and Kohler, after giving up a single and a double, strikes out three in a row, and the Mets wind up with nothing in the opening inning.
there this entire series. Christian Yelich has had a terrific year at age 22. John Carlos Stanton's had an MVP caliber year at age 24. And Jacob DeGrom, who has handled the Marlins handily twice, will get him again tonight. Well, I was looking at the National League rookie pitching leaders, and DeGrom's name is all over the board. Tied for the most, I mean, has the most strikeouts, most innings pitched. As you see his Caesars numbers on the year. It's sort of a shame that DeGrom is pitching in this series and not against the Reds over the weekend. Christian Yelich leads off and takes a strike because you have to figure that the prime contender along with DeGrom for National League Rookie of the Year is the Reds Billy Hamilton. Yes. So they will not be going head to head. But I'm sure there's going to be a lot of press about it once uh, uh, Jacob gets in Cincinnati. Right now he's concentrating on his home state team. He's already had two terrific games against the Marlins this season. He was a hard luck pitcher early in his big league stint after coming up in May. Finally got his first win here on June 21st against the Marlins throwing seven scoreless innings. He's pitched 14 innings against the Marlins only one run and 15 punch outs. And he falls behind on Yelich three and one. Rom has not been walking people. Nine straight starts with two walks or fewer. Solano on deck, Stanton behind him. Yelich swings and misses at the fastball, three and two. I think the thing that I've really appreciated to Grom this season, Gary, is his consistency. Most of the time when you have a young pitcher, they're going to have that blow up game every once in a while. He has not. Maybe two or three, two outings. It's sharply, but right at Tejada. And Ruben throws, and Duda had trouble reaching for that ball, but was able to stay on the bag. That was very awkward on Duda's part. I think he tripped when he got to the bag. I think that's what, what happened. Nice job by Tejada, right at him. And he just kind of he got over there and went to put his foot, and it's like his foot slipped off the bag. And he tripped. If a tree falls at first base, <laughs> as long as he keeps his foot on the bag, all is okay. So an adventurous first out, and now Donovan Solano, two for seven in this series, and he takes a fastball for a strike. When the year began, the plan for the Marlins was to have Rafael Fercal be their everyday second baseman, but other than a brief stint. Where he was able to get on the field for call has missed virtually the entire season with leg problems so it's been a revolving door at second base. With Solano the latest. John Carlos Stanton looming on deck. And the curveball bounces one and two. This is DeGrom's third start since coming back from two weeks on the disabled list. With some mild tendonitis in his rotator cuff. He had the, the iffy start in LA when he was getting the ball up. Adrian Gonzalez hit the home run, but he was right back to being himself his last start against the Phillies. Solano pops one up in foul ground that'll go out of play. Well, in some ways, um, you know, you never think a stint on the DL is a good thing, but it kind of reduced the innings he's going to pitch and reduced the starts he's going to make. So this will allow him, I, I believe, to finish the whole entire year. Yeah, as Terry Collins good. said today, he said we're going to keep an eye on his pitch counts, his innings, but he should be able to make every start through the end of the season. This is his 19th start. Unless his pitch count is ridiculously low, I think I'd do with him in September what the Washington Nationals did with Jordan Zimmerman, uh, pitch him about six innings every single time. Two two to Solano, and he comes up and in. He fouls it off. Well, here's the Lexus uh, Mets defense. The youngsters in the outfield: Nunez and Wright. To Hada gets a start. Youngster Herrera in there again at second base, and Darnell behind the plate. Two two, and the curve ball in the dirt. Full count to Solano. So after DeGrom got ahead of the number two hitter 0 and 2 he goes to a full count with Stanton on deck. And an 
another foul ball. Solano just licked that bat. We've seen Murphy smell the bat. John Nisa got the win last night despite giving up six runs in six innings. I think if you look back at some of his starts earlier in the year, he might have been owed that. And Solano works on a walk after DeGrom got ahead 0 2, a nine pitch walk. And the Marlins have their first base runner. Well, John Carlos Stanton has had a field day in this series already. Well, against Wheeler, he hit three long fly balls. One of them left the yard into the Clevelander. And then yesterday against Jonathan Neese, just as far a home run I've seen in this ballpark. Also had a double to right center in the game last night. He's just been swinging the bat extremely well the entire series. 35 home runs, 101 RBIs, both numbers lead the league. I thought that Juan Lagares put it best after the game yesterday. He said, when Stanton misses it, he hits it to the warning track. <laughs> and so Lagares, who normally plays shallow, is playing as deep as he ever will with Stanton at the plate. And DeGrom didn't get the call on that fastball, one and one. Well, he's, you're right. Uh, Lagares is as deep as you'll see him. You can see double play depth for the middle infielders. David Wright, as far back as he can go. Well, Stanton at age 24 has already hit 152 home runs, and that leaves him just too shy of the Marlins' career record held by Dan Ugla. Stanton got to 100 RBIs last night, became the first. Since Ugla six years ago to do that. 2 1 coming and the curve ball. Stanton couldn't find it. 2 and 2. Nice job by the youngster DeGrom. Hitters count. Little slider. Way out in front of Stanton. Casey McGee on deck. 2 2 to Stanton. Hit the other way onto the glove of Duda and into right field. Solano will go first to third. And the Marlins have runners at the corners with one out. Now this is why Stanton has become so dangerous. He uses the whole field now. Yeah, and that's a, a good fastball from Grom right on the corner with two strikes. I wouldn't say he's going the other way, but we usually see him hit the ball in the air, not on the ground, but gets that past Duda. Just hits everything so hard. You know, he reminds me of him just a little bit because he tried to picture someone you pitch against. Remember Juan Gonzalez when he had those great years in Texas? Stanton's a better player, but that kind of power. Well, the thing about Stanton is now that he's, he's hitting just under 300. I mean, he leads the league in on base percentage and as well as slugging percentage. So, first and third and one out for Casey McGee. And he takes a breaking ball off the plate. McGee three for seven in this series, hitting 340 against the Mets this year. But he has grounded into a league leading 26 double plays, and that's what DeGrom is hoping for here. Mets had second and third, and nobody out of the top of the inning and didn't score. The Marlins hoping to fare better with their threat. And the curveball in for a strike, one and one. He's got that runner in from third 68% of the time. That's one of the reasons he's driven in 64 runs this year at 53 at the All Star break. Right back to DeGrom, who handles it well. Tejada makes the turn, and that gets DeGrom through the opening inning. 1 6 3 double play. A former shortstop who knows how to field his position. It's a big plus. No score after one.
out of trouble thanks to his fielding. Well, he can do it all, and he's a, a, a really, real good fielder. You saw that little crow hop makes the perfect throw to second base. If you can field your position, you get yourself out of jams like that. Well, Casey McGee is now grounded into 27 double plays this year and just extends his National League lead. So both pitchers struggled out of jams in the first inning. No scores. We start the second. Kirk Neuenheis leads off. Neuenheis getting the start in right field today. And they have pitchers fielding practice next spring training. You just send Degrom down with the pitchers. You don't even need a coach. Just follow what he does. You know, I was just thinking about this. Degrom is a terrific fielder, but he's not an elegant fielder. You know what I mean? Because he's all arms and legs. That's why. And the guys who win the gold gloves are usually the guys who do it with grace. They really look like an infielder when they're at their position. You know, he's a very good fielder also. I mean, despite everything else that he does, is Kershaw is a good fielder. That's all he needs, right? <laughs> of course, Kershaw got his 17th win yesterday. A whole bomb eight inning three hit performance. How about this? Bryce Harper hit a home run against him. Not only it was the first home run hit by a lefty against Kershaw this year. It was the first RBI against Kershaw by a lefty wow. this year. <laughs> I mean, it's all crazy, right? It's our SNY crew photo of the week. Mr. <laughs> Met, Billy the Marlin, and our producer, Greg Picker, borrowing Billy's segue. <laughs> it's a nice look. Nice look there, Greg. Very Did you nice. get the thing to roll? <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Would have loved to have seen an action shot. Maybe next time. So new and is aboard and now Dilson Herrera. Herrera playing his sixth big league game. And he takes a strike. Herrera 0 for 5 yesterday after his home run and triple on Monday. And the curveball fouled off and it's 0 and 2. I think we mentioned it last night. That's what we're going to be watching. It seems like he's getting a steady diet, and most young hitters do get this steady diet of breaking pitches from the Marlins pitchers. Well, once you get a couple of hits, so you can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Okay, you can hit the fastball. What's next? You know, Herrera might be short in stature, but he's really put together. He's a very, very muscular player. Even though he's short. Listed at 5'10, 150 pounds. I'm not sure either one of those um, numbers, height or weight, is exactly right. It's probably a little shorter than 5'10, probably weighs a little more than 150. Ahead in the count 0 and 2. And Herrera tries to lay off, but he went around on the breaking ball in the dirt. And that's strikeout number four for Kohler. It's a cruel game sometimes. Once they figure out that you're going to be aggressive and swinging at a breaking ball in the dirt, they'll just keep going to it. Well, we saw that with Ligaris earlier in the year, didn't we? Yeah, Ligaris, though, he has the ability to hit the ball off the plate. I don't know if Herrera has that. So here's Ruben Tejada, who's gotten very little playing time lately, with the emergence of Wilmer Flores getting everyday playing time. Since the 1st of August, Tejada's had just 41 at bats and hitting just 171 in that span. One out and one on, and Nunez getting a lot of attention for a guy who's stolen four bases all year. Well, the Mets have been more aggressive in this series. And Young Mr. Kohler has noticed that. In fact, the Mets have three or more stolen bases in three straight games. They had not done that since 1987. Which is interesting because the Mets have had some very big stolen base teams in recent years with Reyes and Pagan and people like that. Say that's that again. Three or more stolen bases for the Mets in three straight games. 
and that ties the club record. It's only been done four times before, most recently in 1987. Tejada hits a double play ball. Echeverry with a step and fire. 6-6-3 six, six, double play. Side retired. To the bottom of the second we go. No score. September 13th for Fireworks Night presented by Dwayne Reed following the Mets game against the Nationals at 710. For tickets visit Mets.com slash fireworks. Will this be our third fireworks show of the year? That's right. Pyrotechnic wonder. They, they've really refined the whole process now. Remember it used to be when they had the fireworks in Shea they had to clear out half the parking That's lot. Right. <laughs> No, they would tell you because a lot of the players used to park where uh, they would have where the fireworks would go off. So they would tell you on those days to park somewhere else. Well, Zuna flies one out to right center. New and Heiss is there to grab it. One pitch and one out for Jacob DeGrom in the second. So Zuna is retired. Garrett Jones the batter. Jones one for six in this series. Mentioned uh, Kershaw's win last night. Well, the Nats and Dodgers are playing a wild game this afternoon. That's now in the 12th inning. The Dodgers had a 2 0 lead going to the ninth on a Justin Turner two run homer off Jordan Zimmerman. The Nats tied it in the ninth on Adam LaRoche's home run and then got another run in the ninth against Kenley Jansen. And then they were one out away from winning in the bottom of the ninth. And Jason Worth dropped a fly ball and the Dodgers tied it. And they've stayed tied ever since. 1 0 to Garrett Jones, and he takes a knee high strength. Boy, Turner's had a good year, hasn't he, for the really, Dodgers? Really has. Back home. Jared Salt to Lamakia on deck for the Marlins. The Marlins have lost seven of their last 10 games, and with that, they're still only five and a half games out of the second wild card. Can you imagine if they'd had a good last 10 days? They'd be right in it. Here they are just hanging by their fingernails with they have 25 games left to go on the season and did it without Jose Fernandez saw Jose on the field before the game throwing left handed <laughs> 3 1 to Jones there's a strike right now the, uh, the wild card in the National League San Francisco has the top spot Milwaukee the second spot despite losing seven games in a row 
and Atlanta which finally won this afternoon just a game behind Milwaukee. The Braves had scored one run in their previous four games. Swing and a miss and Jones out on strikes. First strike after DeGrom tonight. What did they score seven today? I don't mean they had scored one in each of the last four games. I mean they scored one run total. Three shutouts in the last four games. The only other game they won one nothing. They beat the Marlins Sunday behind Alex Wood. But the, uh, the Braves erupted for seven runs and beat the Phillies today seven four. So now just a game back of that second wild card. Pirates and the Cardinals today one nothing win for the Cardinals. And it was a brouhaha between those two teams. Started when Anderson Volquez hit Matt Holiday and Matt Adams consecutively. And then uh, Shelby Miller threw one behind Andrew McCutcheon. So there was a lot of unhappiness there. Salta Labakia, two for seven in the series. And then the catcher, Russell Martin, got into a shouting match with manager Mike Matheny. They were going back and forth. That I believe is the last regular season meeting between the Pirates and the Cardinals, but who knows? They could wind up seeing each other in the postseason. But that was a that was a bitter loss for the Pirates today. They're now two and a half back of that second wild card. The Cardinals have won five in a row after sweeping that series. Call strike to Salt Lamacchia three and one. I mean the Cardinals just they treaded water till Molina got back, and now all of a sudden they've shot past everybody in the first place. It's almost like they can do. Will it so? We need a tough, a, a hot September, and they've started. The Nats have now taken the lead in that 12th inning in L.A. Adam LaRoche, a two-run single after he hit the two-run homer to tie it in the ninth. There's that Central Division. The Cardinals with their win today, now two and a half up on the Brewers. Milwaukee's in Chicago tonight, with Matt Garza returning from the disabled list to pitch. But uh, Milwaukee held first place from April 5th until three days ago. Now they could be three games out at day's end. 3 2. Salt of the pops one up. Darno comes back for a look, but that's out of play. That's got to be a, a helpless feeling when you're the team that's been in first place all year, and all of a sudden you can just feel it. Getting away. Well, the hard part, Gary, is that they've heard it from everyone all year that they had no business being in the first place and asked over and over, how are you doing it? Now they're not. Now they're not. Eighth pitch of the at bat to Salt Lamakia, and he drives one toward the gap in right center field. That's down for a base hit. Lagaris over to cut it off. Salt Lamakia trying for two. Lagaris's throw, not in time. 19th double of the year for Jared Salt Lamakia. Well, good hitting by Santa Lamacchio who splits the defense here. Good try by Lagaris to get that ball in as quickly as he could. This ballpark is just so big that the gaps seem to go forever. You know, it's interesting to say that because I was watching that ball and it felt like it feels at Coors Field, where there's just so many, so much expanse of the outfield, it's almost impossible to keep a base runner from taking that extra base. So a two out double now at Danny Echeverria. The Mets are not going to mess around with him. They've got the pitcher Kohler on deck. Echeverria has swung the bat well all year, and so the Mets are not going to even try. The intentional pass will put two men on. Interesting. Maybe last year you would have pitched to Echeverria, but he's having so much better of a year. So Kohler, who's a lifetime 061 hitter, will come up instead with two men on. Two for 42 this year. Big difference between the Mets batting order and the Marlins batting order tonight with DeGrom in the nine hole for the Mets. It would be more difficult to pitch around the eight hitter if you're facing the Mets tonight. Kohler looking for his first major league run batted in. 82 career at bats, no RBIs. Unlike the other prominent alum of Stony Brook, Kohler was never a shortstop. Joe Nathan, Joe Nathan was a shortstop right. okay. at, at Stony Brook before he became a pitcher. Joe Nathan, one of the good guys, but boy, he's gone through quite a year this year in Detroit. Well, the 
plight of the Tigers this year is like a, a six volume set. I mean, this is a team that was supposed to blow away their division, and if the postseason began today, they would barely be in as the second wild card team. Yeah. DeGrom misses away two and one. But it's nothing new, you know. Detroit is a, a team that I think the last three or four years you said they should run away with that central, and they never do. And then once they got David Price, you figured it was over. Not been the case. Two and two to Kohler. Salt to Lamaki at second, Etchvari at first. Two out, two on, two and two to Kohler. He gets a piece of it to hang in there. Talking about using smaller fonts in the graphics in a game with Echevarria, Salt of La Mafia, and Neuenheis. That's right. You'd have to go to a, a three point font. Again, the 2 2. Struck him out with a fastball, and so DeGrom able to work around the two out double by Salt of La Mafia with a couple of strikeouts. No score after two. New York Mets baseball on SNY is powered by Verizon. Create, share, and save every Mets moment all season long with the latest devices and accessories from Verizon, America's largest and most reliable network. Downtown Miami, Mets last game in Miami this year. Mets are four and five here, but Nine and six overall against the Marlins this year. Those are the lights from the Clevelander, the nightclub just beyond the left field fence. I always say I'm going to go in there. I've never been in there yet. Jacob DeGrom will lead off the third inning for New York. Jake has 10 hits this year. That's four shy of the Mets' rookie record. 14 hits. Dwight Good, 1984. He's got a chance to get there. Yes, he does. Only had 38 at bats. I would, without looking, guess that Doc had at least twice that many. Oh, easily. Now I'm gonna have to look. <laughs> Colmer pitching him tough on the inside corner, and it's 0-2. Colmer's already struck out four. And DeGrom bounces one off his leg, a foul ball. Lagaris and Dendecker to follow for the Mets in the third. All right, 
Doc's rookie year, 14 hits in 70 at bats. Yeah. So not quite twice as many as DeGrom's 38, but pretty close. His second year in 85, when he had his best season, Doc had 21 hits, which I believe is still the club record. Dwight was so good he was telling everybody he was going to switch hit for a while there. Well, Davey wouldn't let him because back in those days you never expose your pitching arm. Especially not his arm. But DeGrom's pitching arm exposed as so many pitchers are these days. Hmm. It's the first pitcher that we've seen that is consistently pitch DeGrom inside. Well, if you don't pitch him like a real hitter, you're just putting yourself in danger. Goes to the off speed pitch, strikes out to Grom. That's five strikeouts first time through the batting order for Kohler, who's never had more than eight in any big league game. Twisted but true fact brought to you by Twisted Tea, the hard iced tea that tastes like real iced tea. PETA objected to the two aquariums at Marlins Park. They purchased a commemorative brick on display in the ballpark plaza with an anti fishing message on it. There's the aquarium behind home plate. Now, I don't know a lot about, you know, what their objections were. Were they afraid that the fish would be disturbed by a hard foul ball? I mean, they look like they're very happy fish in their aquarium. I, I'm not going after PETA. You're going to have to do that alone. Oh, no, I'm just wondering what their, what their <laughs> yeah. objection was. Not discounting it. <laughs> just trying to figure it out. Ligaris has hits in five straight at bats. Rounds that one weekly to Edge of Aria. And he is retired two out. What we're being told is what Peter said was that not necessarily the, the, the foul balls, but just the general ambient noise in the ballpark might disturb the fish and make them nervous. <laughs> I can't tell whether they're nervous or not. I don't know enough about aquariums. Two out and nobody on now Matt Dendecker who doubled to right his first time up. I'm just glad they didn't throw red paint at the aquarium because it would have ruined the color scheme. I wanted to see what try to figure out the hidden meaning on the brick. We'd have to find it first. Yes. Ball and a strike to Dendecker. So did you get to walk around the ballpark at all? I did. I did. I, I, I did see the, uh, the the bobblehead museum. It's unbelievable for a bobblehead museum. Now I have to ask you a question because yeah. I haven't been down there this year. Did they have the Gary Keith and Ron bobblehead there? Yes, they do. Really? Yes, they do. Wow. Prominently displayed too. I believe. Don't don't quote me on this, but I believe that's my first museum. <laughs> probably not you. You've probably been in several. But I don't believe I've been immortalized anywhere else. They uh, they keep the uh, bobblehead museum shaking slightly so that the heads will continually bobble. Dendecker strikes out. Salt Lamaki makes the toss. That's six strikeouts through the first three innings for Tom Kohler. No score in Miami. Keep them bobbling. Bobble, bobble.
we mentioned the uh, Marlins bobblehead museum. That, of course, is Ralph Kiner and Bob Murphy. That's immortalized great. in bobbleheadedness. You got uh, Harry Callis and Richie Ashburn on the right, Bob Euchre on the left. <laughs> so that's the broadcaster's wing of the bobblehead right. museum. Top of the batting order, Christian Yelich leading off the home third for Miami in a scoreless game. And a little tapper up the line that'll go foul one and one so DeGrom throwing far more pitches than he'd like to these first couple of innings first inning he got out of trouble first and third and one out got the double play and then in the second gave up the two out double to salt to Lamakia that increased his pitch count so 48 pitches in the first two innings for DeGrom and a time of year where if nothing else they are monitoring his pitch count and his innings. The way in that extraordinary game at Dodger Stadium, Carl Crawford just had a two run homer in the bottom of the 12th, and the Dodgers tied it again. They're 5 to 5 now. The game of much greater importance to the Dodgers, who have a two game lead in the West, than to the Nationals, who have a six and a half game lead in the East after the Braves won today. 2 2 coming to Yelich. And he misses inside with a slider. Full count. Yelich, Solano, and Stanton. Second time through the batting order for DeGrom. He's already walked two, one intentionally. And Yelich got a piece of the changeup and fouled it off. A lot more breaking pitches on 3 2 counts, 2 1 counts. What does that tell you? It doesn't feel like you. Sometimes you do that when you don't feel like you have your real good fastball that day. Hit toward the hole. Tejada smothers it nicely. The throw, not quite in time. Terrific effort by Tejada, but Yelich has an infield hit. Well, nice play by Ruben sitting on that bench and coming off and. Lost his footing just a little bit, couldn't get enough on that throw. Yelich has some good speed also. So a leadoff base runner for the Marlins, who have their third hit against DeGrom. And now Solano who walked his first time up. Yelich has 16 stolen bases, so DeGrom will have to keep an eye on him. Has given up eight stolen bases and 12 tries this year. What does the card say? Keith Hernandez. Giveaway June 2012 arriving 2013 or 2012. Oh, I guess it. Oh, oh it made it. Oh, yes, okay. Yes, yes, All yes. right. So that was an old shot. Yeah. And now he. Keith has arrived. Paulo Duke has got his mask off. Tommy Clavin. Oh, so he had the mask on in the old shot and off. Wait a second. Well, oh, I, I I sense something nefarious here. <laughs> now, did the Luduka bobblehead come with a removable mask? Well, was or the, did they replace him? Was the first Luduka in a Mets uniform or a Dodger uniform? It could have been the Marlins uniform. Marlins uniform. That's right. Oh and two to Solano with Stanton on deck. He fouls it away. Apparently they took the mask off the Laduca bobblehead so he could sign it properly. And well, then couldn't get the mask back on. Well that's the one thing about the bobblehead is that I I get a lot of people want me to sign the bobblehead, but it's really no place to really sign it. Toward the middle of the diamond, that's a base hit for Solano. 
And the Marlins have the first two men out of the third with Stanton coming up. So Solano's on base for the second straight time. A little slider there that Solano hits up the middle, but just like Wheeler on the first night here, it doesn't look like the ground has that good fastball. Oh, so he could sign on his helmet there. I see. That's fun. It's a true investigative reporting. So a moment of truth for DeGrom. First and second, nobody out. Giancarlo Stanton at the plate. And he takes inside. Ball one. Stanton get a hot shot just underneath Duda's glove for a base hit in the first inning. And the curveball could be a double play. Tejada to Herrera and on to first double play. Mets turn their second of the night. Six four three, two away. Oh, beautiful job by the ground fastball in and then slider away that Stanton tried to pull. And Tejada to Herrera to Duda. Nicely turned. By the way, Herrera's had some defensive difficulties. Turning the double play is not one of them. He is fearless in there. Yeah, he stays right in there. So two out Yelich at third and now here's McGee who grounded into a double play his first time up. So DeGrom has really helped himself by generating two double play grounders. We see Solano comes in there tries to upset Herrera but just steps over him. The two Colombians. Two of the 14 who have played in the major leagues. Perfect place for it, by the way. I'm told that the Colombian community in Miami is the largest in the country. Some 115,000 Colombians make Miami their home. And for this weekend, Wilson Herrera, an honored guest. One and one to McGee. And he dribbles one off the end of the bat. And DeGrom ahead of the count, one and two. Well, Jacobs had plenty of traffic to negotiate but one thing we've learned about him and we learned it very quickly in his major league career he just doesn't get rattled with men on base. Comes inside with a breaking ball two and two. And we've said this several times during Jacobs young career even on the days when he hasn't had his best stuff. Found a way. Yeah, he figures out a way. I mean, they're trying to throw a change up to the right handed hitter. He doesn't throw many of those. Two in a row. So now a full count to McGee. Marcelo Zuna would be next. What's the downside of having to deal with all this difficulty is that DeGrom's pitch count is getting up there. 3 2 coming. Grounded off the glove of DeGrom into no man's land. Herrera in the bare hand, and it can't be handled by Duda. And the first run of the game comes home. Looked like they were going to have McGee at first base, but Duda couldn't make the connection. I don't even think this throw hit the dirt. Just missed by Lucas. Would he have been safe? Not sure. Well, hustling McGee down there. Very close play. Well, they've given McGee, McGee credit for a base hit, which means the scorer believes he would have been safe, but I don't think so. I think he would have been out. I think he would have been out too. In which case, I think you have to give Duda an error, don't you? Now, you can't have replay to make that decision, can you? No. <laughs> so McGee gets credit for an RBI, his 65th, and the Marlins able to squeak out a run here in the third. Now it's Ozuna, and he takes a strike. Well, that was a case of DeGrom with uh, his great height and reach able to get a piece of that ball. Had he not, would there have been a play for the middle infielder? Yeah, it would have been an easier play for Herrera. He was playing McGee a little up the middle anyway. And a fastball strike to Ozuno with two. How high he gets for this ball. He's 
every bit of six four six five and then goes up and just gets it off the tip of his glove. Jacob now over 70 pitches working in the third inning. Got the double play ball. Looked like he was most of the way there, but McGee with a fortunate hit to drive in the first run of the game. It's unfortunate to see that though, because you know Herrera made a great play to get to it. Makes a, a good throw on the run, and you just got to be able to catch that. I mean, it's a you know the sloppy play started in the first game with the six errors, but. All of these things, collateral damage, higher pitch counts. Well, there's no no reason why Duda shouldn't have caught that yeah. ball. I mean, it was it was a low throw, but it didn't hit the ground. And again, it, had he caught it, I'm sure we would have had a replay to see whether he was safe or out. But it appeared at the on the replay we saw that he probably would have been out. In any event, it's two and two now to Ozuna, and he struck him out with the fastball. Third strikeout for DeGrom. But the Marlins able to eke out the first run of the game. They lead 1 0 after three. Fourth inning, David Wright will lead off against Tom Kohler. For more on Mr. Kohler, let's check in with Kevin Burkhardt. Kevin? Uh, Gary, you mentioned Stony Brook before, and of course, uh, the biggest name out of Stony Brook we know is Joe Nathan, but Matt Sink is the big name at Stony Brook because he's been coaching there for 25 years now. He's been an institution. He turned that whole program around, really, and now they're a terrific program. And he, of course, coached Nathan and Tom Kohler. I asked him on the phone yesterday what the first time that he saw Kohler was at New Rochelle High School. He said he was intense. First time I met him, he was intense. He said, you know what, though? I didn't go to scout him. I went to, to look at a, a baseball tournament on Long Island. His team was playing. And he said, you know, I think as a coach, as a college coach, you're always looking for intangibles. And I could see um, his enthusiasm for the game and his enthusiasm for his teammates really stood out. I mean, obviously, he had a terrific fastball and a good breaking ball, too. But he just had that about him. And, you know, when he came aboard the program, he was always very, very intense. He had that great stuff. But it was interesting. He didn't get drafted after high school. He did not get drafted after his junior year and I think his feeling was that he would and Sank told me it was because his shape came back to bite him he said he, he was not maybe in the greatest of shape despite having this great stuff and after he didn't get drafted his junior year he took it to heart he went on a, a great program for nutrition he dieted he worked out he estimated he lost about 30 pounds maybe 40 pounds and then guess what the Marlins took him after his senior year and now he's here so Matt Sank has molded some good ones and Kohler turning into a real good one. And he 
just struck out his seventh batter of the night, which is just one shy of his career high. It was interesting seeing some of those shots from Stony Brook and, and the kind of different mechanics he had in college. Uh, uh, I know that my mechanics in college were completely changed when I came to the pros because they said you can't land on a stiff front leg. You can't cuff the baseball. So there was uh, two or three things that I had to change. It looks like Kohler has done the same thing. Here's Duda and they put on the full shift against Lucas this time. And he gets one in the air to center. Ozuna with the back pedal. Two out. Guys, Stony Brook just had their uh, their third alum called up too. Nick Trapiano just got called up to the Astros the other day, so it's uh, it's another one for Matt Sank in the big leagues. See the difference in the legs now. He has that high knee that comes right to his glove, and before he used to kind of cast it out there. Those are all the things that you work on when you're in the minor leagues to get yourself in a, a better position to last longer. Take some of the strain off your arm. Quickly two out and nobody on. Travis Darno took a call third strike his first time up. Well, the Mets, who were striking out in droves early in the season, have not been striking out as much the second half as Darno leans out of the way. But here's a guy who doesn't strike out many, who's already fanned seven Mets. Through the first three and two thirds. Well, he always pitches well against the Mets. I'm sure the incentive is, is pitching against the, the New York team. Knows everyone's watching. Kohler behind 2 and 0 oh and outside 3 and 0. Oh. See that photo of that casted front leg kind of like he kicks it out that heel to third base. And now not as casted as much and it's a little bent also. Three and one to Darno. That's about just two hits. They came the first two batters against Kohler, second and third, and nobody out. They didn't score, and he's rolled since. That's low, though, ball four, and it's two out walk to Darno. The second given up by Kohler. Here's Kirk Newenheis who drew a walk his first time up. This is Newenheis's 16th start of the year. And make of this what you will. In the 15 games he started prior to today, the Mets are 13 and 2. Some number. Right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to. Well, early this year, the Mets had a number like that with Eric Young, right? Yes. But that quickly got cast aside. They also had a similar number for a while with Anthony Recker. But now it's Duenheis who's been the good luck charm. And he hits it in the air to deep right center field. Back goes Ozuna. Takes a look. That ball is out of here. A monstrous home run into the second deck in right center off the bat of Kirk Duenheis. His third home run of the year, and he got every bit of it. And the Mets go in front two to one. And that's more than being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> that's that's helping that record. That's causation that's right there. there you go. Cause and an effect and effect for New and Heist. I mean, this is a big ballpark, and he made it look small, hitting it up in the second deck in right center. Two out walk to Darno hurts Kohler. Well, trying to come inside with the fastball, and it comes right open the middle of the plate. And I don't know if we've seen Newenheis hit one this far before. Maybe it's Florida. He had a couple, had a two home run game in Tampa early in his career. So Newenheis getting the spot start with Granderson sitting tonight and making it pay off. Walk his first time up and now a monstrous two run homer. A 
mean the fans in this ballpark are used to seeing some tape measure home runs. But usually it's number 27 the right fielder on the home team not the right fielder for the visitors. I mean when you come to the ball game and you sit in that seat you're not expecting to go home with a souvenir. Nelson Herrera struck out his first time up and he takes the fastball high three and two. So Kohler got himself the lead and retired the first two hitters here in the fourth with no difficulty. But a walk to Darno and Neuenheis crushes one. There's strike three called. Fastball got Herrera looking. That's eight strikeouts for Tom Kohler matching his season high. But now he finds himself behind in the game. Neuenheis is home run, two to one New York. Some of the scene down on South Beach. No more South Beach this year. <laughs> Let's be in Cincinnati for the weekend where there's no South Beach. Garrett Jones leads off for the Marlins in the home fourth. Jacob DeGrom working with the lead for the first time. Jones struck out his first time up. Not been easy for DeGrom tonight. He's given up five hits and two walks over the first three innings. Well, we've talked about this before. This is the most difficult month for your young pitchers and players because they're used to a minor league season, which, unless you make it to the playoffs, which Mets teams have in the minor leagues, um, you have September off. The season ends in late August. So you're making you know, five or six more starts. Right down the middle for a ball. 2 2 coming. That's up and away. Well, the goal is, right, and, and Zach Wheeler was talking about this yesterday, to finish strong through September so that when you get a chance to play in October, you know what that's yeah. like. And you're ready for it. That's certainly where the Mets hope to be in future years. Jones chases a slider. He's down on strikes. Fourth strikeout for Jacob DeGrom. Went right back with that slider that wasn't called, but this one out of the strike zone. So one out of nobody on. What helps you in, in October is that the weather's a little cooler. Uh, that seems to give you a little more life. It's also postseason, so you're paying attention. Well, that that was going to be my next question. You know, we talk about um, players trying to get through that 
difficult September which they've never played in before. But is it different if you're playing pennant race games in September as opposed to just playing in September? Um, I, I think it. it well, it's an interesting question because I did not finish strong. You know, I think though by just pitching in September, even though I didn't pitch well, by just making those starts, um, the starts in the next year were much easier to make in September, and I pitched better in September the next year. But um, so we, we, we played so meaningful games so in you, September in '84. I was going to say until you broke your thumb. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was until '87, but. Yeah, so it's kind of like I guess what I'm saying it's kind of like a process you have to go through it at the Garama Wheeler have to go through it and you try to finish strong this year it's important of course but it's also going to make it much easier the, the seasons after that. O2 to Salt Lamaki and he strikes him out with a curveball so back to back strikeouts for DeGrom to start this home fourth inning. Well, a lot of strikeouts on both sides good breaking ball. In recognition of number 48, Jacob DeGrom's rookie, rookie season, get four tickets for just $48 to all games through September 17th. To purchase four field level tickets for just $48, get to Mets.com slash DeGrom. Here's Echeverria, who was intentionally walked his first time up. Two for seven in this series, including his 10th triple of the year in the game yesterday. D. Gordon of the Dodgers has more. And he grounds that one down to right. David makes it a harder play. <laughs> throws him out to end the inning. David backing up on that ball, playing it off to the side, but he gets Echeverria to give DeGrom his first one, two, three inning. Photo for tonight. Hey, we know that guy. That's right. How'd he get in the ATT fan photo? <laughs> Kevin's got fans everywhere he goes. You know what it is? It's part of the month long Kevin Burkhardt appreciation. That's right. Send off. It's not quite Jeter, but you know. <laughs> we had a beautiful dinner on Monday after the day game. We all got together. That was a blast. We're going to probably show some things later in the month of some of Kevin's greatest moments. I think we should show some of the not so great moments too, so oh, we can I'm, have, I'm have sure some fun be, with it. Definitely <laughs> both. Nice, nice, healthy balance. Ruben Tejada leads off in the fifth inning. Ruben bounced into a double play his first time up. By the way, they're now in the 14th inning in LA. Nats and Dodgers tied 5-5. And Tejada takes a strike. Dodgers with a chance for the win to add to their lead because the Giants got 
roasted and toasted by the Rockies today. Nine to two. The uh, the best season that nobody has any idea about. Corey Dickerson of the Rockies. Two more home runs today. Say 22 or 23 home runs. Yeah. Wow. So uh, his slugging percentage is in the 550s. He's uh, Charlie Blackman got a lot of attention early in the year, made the All Star team, but Dickerson has had an even better year. Line down the left field line, and Tejada's got himself an extra base hit. Ruben takes the turn as Yelich had trouble picking it up, but he'll stay at second with a leadoff double, his 10th double of the year. Well, nice hitting right there. Fastball inside. Great job by Tejada handling that pitch. Good pitch from Kohler. Pulls those hands in. That's the best part of the bat on that ball. Now the Marlins look for the bunt from DeGrom, who has four sacrifices to go with his 10 hits this year. Fair ball, throw goes to third for the tag play, and Tejada's is out. Uh, not a good bunt dive by DeGrom, only got it a few inches in front of the plate, and Sultan Lamaki easily able to gun down Tejada. Well, th this is definitely DeGrom's fault for not making a better bunt, but you know, when you're on second base and you're the runner, you don't have to go. If you read that the bunt is not far enough in front of the plate, you can stay at second base. Tough play, though, for a runner. See that ball right there just what three four feet. I don't know if it's how hard it is to read it if you're in Tejada's position but. So instead of a runner in scoring position DeGrom is on first with one on Juan Ligaris takes away for ball one. Ligaris one for two led off the game with a base hit up the middle his fifth consecutive hit. Then he grounded out to short in the third. Lagar is six for 11 in this series. And that's on the corner, one and one. Lagaris and Dendecker began the game with a single and a double. Mets at second and third and nobody out. And then Kohler struck out three in a row. Comebacker, chance for two. Echeverria with the turn. Not in time. But Garris beat it out. And the inning continues. Well, Kohler didn't get a lot on this throw. When you have a guy like Lagaris running, you got to put a little more on the throw. This allowed Lagaris to be safe at first base. Close, close play. Looked like the correct call by Andy Fletcher at first. And no challenge from Mike Redman. So the Mets have Lagaris at first with two out, Dendecker at the plate, and we mentioned earlier Lagaris and his recent stolen base exploits. This would certainly be the spot for it. Five steals in his last five games, after only four in the first four months of the season. But Dendecker first pitch swinging, bangs one up the middle for a base hit. Lagaris taking no chances against Ozuna's arm, stops at second. So Dendecker has his second hit of the game, and the Mets have two on for David Wright. Well, it's nice to see Dendecker and Newenheis having a good game in tonight's game. This ball, just a ground ball up the middle, that just eludes the glove of Solano. Good choice here by Lagaris. The arm of Azuna is so good, couldn't go first to third. He knows all about center fielders who can throw. So here's Wright, who after his big day yesterday has been up twice and struck out both times against Kohler. Kohler's matched his career high with eight strikeouts already today, but finds himself behind in the game and now has to find his way out of two out trouble. And David shoots one foul. Nationals have just regained the lead in the top of the 14th. They got a run, and then as Drupal Cabrera hit a two run homer, and the Nats are up eight to five in the top of the 14th in LA. Right lifts one foul, and again he finds himself in an 0 2 hole. And this has been such a story of David's season, isn't it? 
I mean, a guy who has throughout his career had a terrific on base percentage. He, he almost never walks anymore and frequently has found himself behind on the count of two. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, and maybe it's because of his numbers this season, especially the home run numbers and extra base hits numbers down. Pitchers are being much more aggressive than they've been with David in the past. Backhanded by Salt of Lamacchia, one and two. If, if you're pitching to a hitter that you consider one of the elite hitters in the game, you're going to be more careful than you will if you think that he's not having a great season. Be aggressive with him right now. Garris at second, Den Decker at first, good speed on the bases with two down. Two to one, New York, fifth inning. And Wright takes the slider, strike three call. Third time tonight, Wright has been struck out. Kohler has a new career high, nine strikeouts. That's lead 2 1 halfway through. Mets and I'm sitting here high in center field looking down at Juan Laguerre and I've watched him all year like you have one thing I noticed he can eat a lot of sunflower seeds I mean this is this is not not the normal sunflower seed eater um, he will go through on average four bags a game. four bags of sunflower seeds a game I talked to him about it today he started laughing he said you know I don't know what it is I don't eat them anywhere else but at the ballpark I don't I don't like them anywhere else but here it just kind of feels right and yeah I go through about four bags a game I keep the big bag in my back pocket and he'll keep chugging them in there the whole game it didn't seem to bother him when he's going after a ball as a matter of fact he told me about a month ago his mom called him and said what do you have in your mouth the whole game and he's going to find a base hit here for, for the Marlins it's Kohler the pitcher who starts it off and he said well it's seeds." he said look at it this way I don't chew tobacco I don't really like bubble gum so I don't really think it's that big of a deal Wilmer Flores lockers next to him here in Miami he said he doesn't ever stop eating. A lot of seeds, guys. That's a lot of seeds. Uh, I'd be concerned with all the seeds that he puts in his mouth that he's swallowing shells. Or, or, the, or the sodium. Sodium uh, uh, alone. But uh, oh, you can get the unsalted variety. Oh, there you go. That's right. Here's the Christian Yelich with uh, Kohler, just his third hit in 44 at bats out at first base. And a change up by DeGrom. Nothing in one. Well, it's much better to have the sunflower seeds. I'm glad that. There's still a lot of major leaguers that dip or chew, but a lot less than certainly in my day, and that's a good thing, great thing. You know, they've stopped it in the minor leagues. I'd wish they'd stop it in the major leagues, too. Well, of course, that's up to the union to agree right. to. 
but you would think that banning it in the minor leagues at least has to put something of a damper on guys getting started. That would be the best uh, way to remember uh, Tony Gwynn's uh, maybe to stop it in the major leagues. Yelich dribbles one off the line and just goes foul. Have you, have you ever chewed or, or dipped no. or ballpark? No. I'd have to I've say. had a lot of sunflower seeds in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of bubble gum. I'll stick there. It's hard to consume either one of those products when we're on the air, though. So. That's <laughs> It's got to be a hard thing for a player to adjust to if he does um, indulge in in tobacco while he's a ball player, because it's you know it's not exactly welcomed in other areas in real life. Yeah. So once you retire, it's something that uh, you have to really come to terms with. Yeah. Yelich had an infield hit in the third and scored the only Marlins run. He's one for two on the night. Duda is holding against Kohler at first base. With a left hand hitter up. Seems odd. Should be behind him. Give him a little fake in there and then back up. Two two from DeGrom. And Yelich hits the breaking ball out to left. Pretty well hit, but then Decker has room. A long first down, and Kohler goes back to first. Pretty seamless, doesn't it, for Den Decker in left field? Just, uh, I mean, he's a center fielder by trade, and he's a real good center fielder. Maybe not, certainly not as good as Lagaris, but left field has been no problem for him. You forget just how great yeah. he was a couple of springs ago before he broke his wrist. And um, it's interesting watching him in the same outfield with Ligaris, isn't it? There's Solano swinging, missing nothing and one. Because Dendecker's got a very different style in the outfield. He's he's a terrific outfielder, but he just doesn't he doesn't move as smoothly as yeah. Ligaris does. Reminds me a little bit of, of Lenny Dykstrom when he runs out there. You know, kind of, uh, you know, not the uh, like life out there like Lagaris is. Maybe it's the lefty thing too. <laughs> Ninety-six pitches now for Degrom, working with one out in the fifth inning. So, just like uh, Wheeler. In the opening game of this series, Jacob throwing a lot of pitches to get to the middle of the game. 0 oh 2 to Solana with Stanton on deck. And this is low and away. Worth noting as DeGrom's pitch count rises and we move toward the Mets bullpen that Jerry's familiars worked three days in a row and Terry Collins is bound to determine not to use him tonight. So he's going to have to find a different game plan to get through the late innings without Familia. One, two. Lifted along the right field line, and Newenheis comes over. Two out. Stay on top of all things Jets as they get ready to open their season against the Raiders with a constant flow of up to the minute news and opinion, plus fan discussions, player profiles, and exclusive video on Jets blog featured on SNY.TV, your online home of all things New York sports. So here is Stanton, who's one for two, single to right on the first, and then DeGrom in a big spot, first and second, and nobody out, got him to ground into a 6 4 3 double play. That was in the third. Guys, I'll have you know that uh, Juan has dipped into the seeds six times so far this <laughs> inning. I I would definitely choke <laughs> and kill over. He's impressive. <laughs> you know, there is such statistical overkill on everything these days. I'm sure there's got to be some kind of stat brewing on one of the 
websites or that Elias keeps on most times dipping into the sunflower <laughs> seeds in an inning. Pretty sure Juan's got a six war on sunflower <laughs> seeds. <laughs> <laughs> Just tag it on. <laughs> Just think of the trail he leaves in center field. With the shells. Two and one to Stanton. And that's on the corner. Two and two. Well, that might have been his biggest pitch of the game. Two one change up. Right on the outside corner and knees. Kohler at first and two out. Two two coming to Stanton. And it's fouled away. The Mets had a lot of success the last few years coming up and into Stanton. We haven't seen nearly as much of that in this series. And that's one of the reasons he's having the series he's having is because the Mets are not pitching him in this series. You've got to pitch him right in at the hands on the inside corner. Garno sets up away, and he just got a piece of that fastball to hang in there. When you watch his stance, he probably stands as far away from the plate as anyone in the game. But he's six foot six inches tall. He's got extremely long arms, so he can still reach that outside corner. This will be the seventh pitch of the at bat from DeGrom to Stanton. Struck him out. Jacob DeGrom strikes out John Carlos Stanton. Six strikeouts for DeGrom through the first five innings. Able to get the big guy out to keep the Mets in the lead. 2 1 after five. Don't know if he's done or not, but he's done his best pitching since the Mets got him the lead. Something you can't teach that he's gotten better over the last two innings, but I, I would say my judgment would be to take him out of the game after the five innings. If you're trying to limit some of his innings, and most of the early innings were pitched under duress. Lucas Duda leads off in the sixth inning against Tom Kohler, who's pitched pretty well in his own right. Struck out a career high nine over the first five innings, but a monstrous home run off the bat of Kirk Neuenheis. The difference in this game. 
Duda has struck out and flied out 0 for 2 just four hits in his last 33 at bats which makes you think maybe using that left side for a bunt hit might be a good idea. And he takes the breaking ball outside for ball one. Is it interesting to you Gary that they now are playing the shift against Duda in the third game of the series. I think part of his cold is a guy who likes to pitch in. He throws a lot of sliders down and in. So due to more apt to pull the ball. Hasn't hit a ball to the left side this entire series, which might have influenced them as well. Now Kohler behind him 2 0 with Darno and Neuenheis to follow. And now 3 0. So the Nationals win that game in 14 innings, 8 to 5, as Dribble Cabrera hitting the two run homer to add to the Nats' lead. And there's ball four to Duda. So the Dodgers lose, the Giants lose. The Dodgers' lead stays at two games in the NL West. Did you see, by the way, who the Giants called up? They called up Bruce Bochy's son. Oh, that's right. Brett Bochy, who's now working out of the Giants' bullpen. It's got to be a very strange situation. Well, I, I can't remember a pitcher uh, with a manager being a manager's son. I've you know, seen players before. Moise Salou, yeah. probably the most recent. It's Travis Darno who takes the strike. I asked Bochy about managing his son. He said in spring training this year he had to bring him in. He brought him in with the bases loaded. Oh, nice. <laughs> and they were kidding him after the game, said, We thought you liked your son. <laughs> Darno hits the comebacker. Another chance for two. Solana with the turn for the 1 4 3 double play. So the Marlins turn their second double play of the night. I'm just right back to Cole who makes the nice throw. With Darno running now, not as much urgency. Throw the ball a little harder for the second. He couldn't turn the double play on the comebacker on the ball hit by Lagaris in the last inning. This time, no problem. Well, this is the only guy who's been a problem for Kohler. Neuenheis, who cranked one into the second deck in right center. Which, let me tell you, folks, is, is no mean feat. I mean, he just he exploded this ball. I mean, just fastball down the middle. It's interesting, right? Kirk knew he had gotten it all, but he knows how big this ballpark was, so he started digging. He has seen how many times in this series John Carlos Stanton has shaken his head seeing a ball come up short of the wall. And if, if the big guy's shaking his head then you, you better run everything out. New and high sits a home run here guy does it change what you think about going into September does new and high get a few more starts in right field. Well I think that's the question. Mm. Would the Mets sit Granderson for an appreciable period of time? Or if Neuenheis gets more playing time, would it come at the expense of Dendek? I mean, again, you want to see what your young players can do, but you're locked into Granderson for a long, a long period of time. And you're hoping he gets out of it in September, so next year is not an issue. I mean, I gave this number in passing earlier today, but it's almost unheard of. Granderson's right now in an 0 for 18 streak. He has now had seven separate streaks this year of 0 for 17 or more. I mean, think about that. Seven times he's gone 0 for 17 or more. Now, he got off to a slow start in April, looked like he had turned it around in May and June, and since the All Star break, nothing. Two out walk, the fourth given up by Kohler. And Herrera comes up with a man on. I mean, I don't even know how you analyze it. I know that it's very difficult to for Curtis to do anything but speak yeah, optimistically yeah, because that's what he does. He's a very optimistic person, but the results have just been unbelievably bad. Sometimes it's a. Uh Get sick of being so optimistic because you need some results at some point. Herrera has struck out twice tonight, swinging in the second, looking in the fourth. New and Heist at first, stole a base earlier in the series, and takes it outside. Herrera does one on one. I remember one year, Gary, I think I had a 
10 or more no decisions in a row. And I remember always saying to people, well, you know, we're winning the games. That's all that really matters. Total lie. <laughs> Didn't feel that way at all, you know? Felt awful. About to throw his 95th pitch of the night. He's walked four and struck out nine. Allowed two runs and five hits. Well, you said it during the open tonight. Regardless of everything else that goes around this team, the Mets need their big guys to hit. They need Wright and Granderson to be. Front and center next year. These are guys the Mets have long term commitments to. Strike three called, and Herrera is struck out for the third time tonight. Tom Kohler reaches double digits in strikeouts for the first time in his career. But the 10 strikeouts, not enough so far. The Mets lead it 2 1 in the sixth. Relationship between Mets players and the media. From the challenges to the intense competition, see what it takes to cover a team in the New York spotlight on Mets Insider, presented by WB Mason, Sunday at noon, only on SNY. Well, Jacob DeGrom's back out there, 105 pitches deep, working with a 2 1 lead in the home sixth. Casey McGee fouls back the fastball. McGee's driven in the only run for the Marlins, and that was on a bouncer. That was deflected by DeGrom. Mets almost got the out at first. That would have ended the inning, but Duda did not handle the throw from Herrera, and that's how the Marlins got their only run. Get the other way. Newenheis closing ground. Gets there. One out. Cold hard facts brought to you by Frost Brew at Coors Light. Jacob DeGrom last 11 starts. Brilliant. Hmm. Seven and two, two point one two. Keeping the ball in the ballpark. His walks have gone down since the beginning of the season. Strikeouts have gone up. One out and nobody on. Now Marcelo Zuna, who has flied out and struck out, 0 for two. We've been talking for a good portion of the game about that Washington. L.A. game that ended in 14 innings today. 
this is September baseball for you. This stat. Grounded toward the hole. Right cuts it off. The spinorama on a hop. Not in time. David just couldn't get enough on the throw. Terrific effort, but Ozuna has an infield hit. Well, David ranges far to his left to get this ball, but by going that far, really didn't put him in any position to throw the ball to first. I like the spinorama call, by the way, and almost makes the play. It's from Alexi Kovalev. Yes. That's pretty close play. Terry Collins is going to challenge the call. Let's see if we can get a little better angle so we can have some idea whether Ozuna was actually out. But Terry Collins has decided to challenge here in the sixth inning. Let's see. Well, I think he's out. It's very close. I think he's out of first base. We're back to that. Where, where's the ball in the glove kind of deal? Clear and convincing evidence is what the folks in New York need to overturn the call. That's the thing that's changed this year too. Is that if the call has been made on the field, it, it's got to take really a lot of evidence for them to change it. See the glove disappears behind the runner there, so it's hard for us to see exactly where it. Hit the back of the glove. Oh, you can see it there. This foot is not on the bag. They have oh, they're playing yeah, the they replay. Got, yep, they got a replay on the big board here that must have come from the Marlins TV. I think this is it. And he does appear to be out. So we'll see if New York agrees. And they do. The call is overturned. And David Wright, with its spectacular play, winds up getting the out at first base. And that's the second out of the inning. Play under review is brought to you by Mazda. Conviction, creativity, courage. This is the Mazda way. Fantastic play, but David didn't really get to enjoy it. He just watched it on the board. Nature of the beast. <laughs> two out and nobody on. Here's Garrett Jones, who's 0 for 2. Struck out both his at bats. So DeGrom has a chance to get himself through six. When he took the mound here for the sixth inning, you figured, well, maybe get a batter or two, but he got the first two hitters out on just four pitches. Or five, anyway. Now he's behind 2 0 on Jones. That's bullpen is ready to go if DeGrom needs help. Buddy Carlisle's been loosening up. Dario Alvarez, the left-hander, getting ready as well. Rahm has walked two, one of those intentionally. He's now behind on Jones, three and zero. And there's a the strike. You know, I was going to give that stat for the Washington yeah. LA game. September baseball, right? Expanded rosters. The Nats used 15 different players in the ninth spot of the batting order today. Ten pitchers and five pinch hitters. Wow. Fifteen players in one spot in the batting order. Tejada guns down Jones. DeGrom through six. Strong effort from Jacob DeGrom as usual. Two one Mets after six.
get through that sixth. So he's now done after six innings in which he was in a lot of trouble, didn't have his best stuff, and yet still allowed just one run. Yes, uh, we were talking in between innings. He's just got a, a fighting spirit, does the Grom. Ruben Tejada will lead off the seventh inning with the Mets up two to one. Josh Satin has come out on deck to pinch hit for DeGrom. And then Ligaris. Ball one to Tejada. Ruben had a double down the left field line in the fifth inning. Then was thrown out at third as DeGrom tried to sacrifice. And the Mets were turned aside in that fifth. Tom Kohler still out there throwing. Kohler has walked four, struck out ten, given up two runs and five hits. And hoping to hang around long enough in this game for his team to rally against the Mets bullpen. Two and zero to Tejada. He pops one up. Echeverria out to call and puts it away. One out. Sunday immediately after the Jets Raiders game tune into SNY for behind the scenes access player reactions and a complete game breakdown with exclusive on field interviews and Rex Ryan's post game comments on Jets post game live presented by Toyota Sunday immediately after the Jets Raiders game only on SNY. Well here is Josh Satin his first big league at bat since the middle of May. Josh was with the Mets at the beginning of the season struggled went three for twenty eight got sent down and. At 289 in Vegas this year. This is a guy who was supposed to be a big part of this team, but just didn't produce enough early on. And Eric Campbell basically took his spot. Yes, he has. I think the one difference I think they thought coming in that Satin was going to be a, a, a the better hitter. Driven to right center, Stanton reaching to make the grab. And Josh hit the ball hard. But Stanton is like a gazelle out there, made the play. Needed all six foot six inches to make that play in right field. I was just thinking of Satin, you know, I think they thought he was going to be the better hitter of the two, but I think Campbell's athleticism has moved him up. Also, his ability to play infield and outfield. Uh, I was talking to Josh when he came back to the ball club this week, and he said it's been his hardest season for a lot of different reasons. He said, even when they went down and in Vegas and I was getting hits I wasn't getting the right kind of hits you know that's a strange thing yeah. for a hitter to say but he, he just never felt like himself all year tinkered a lot with his stance and um, I think he's very happy to be back here but um, it's been kind of a, I think in his view a lost year for it, him. it can happen sometimes when you're on that train back and forth to triple A sometimes those years just don't work. Juan Lagares is one for three at a base hit his first time up tonight. And he hits one back to Kohler. So Tom Kohler able to get himself through seven. That takes us to the seventh inning stretch. Mets will go to their bullpen, leading two to one.
second appearance in this series. He'll come on in relief of Jacob DeGrom, who is standing by with Kevin Burkhardt. Kevin? Oh, Jacob uh, here with us now. Just tell me, first of all, about the shoulder. You got that, that, that little DL stint. Did that energize you a little bit, and do you feel, feel good right now? Yeah, I would say it energized me. Um, you know, I, I felt good in my past two starts. Or was that my third one? I think it was the third one. Yeah, my, yeah, that was my third one. So my past three starts felt really good, no problems with it. So uh, I think the break helped me out a lot. What is it like, and what have you what have you been thinking about as a young pitcher getting to this point in the season, getting to September? Apparently our light bulb went out. We've got to buy a new one of those. As we get to this point in September, though, as a younger guy, what have you been thinking about, about the challenges of finishing the season strong? Um... You know, it's my, this is the longest I've pitched, um, so I'm just, you know, learning that, going, uh, you know, with a lot of innings, and, um, you know, hopefully next year we're in a playoff run, and, you know, can learn from this and take it into next year. What was your mindset, and how aggressive were you against Stanton tonight? You had some success, got the double play, and then the strikeout. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was aggressive against him, um, you know, starting off, starting off with some breaking, uh, breaking balls, and, I got some outs, uh, you know, the ground ball, I think was on a curve ball. Um, you know, I was just going right after him and uh, trying to just locate. Yeah, you know, he had a, he had a hit one against Nice, and, and Nice and Terry Collins both thought that, hey, it was a pretty good pitch. You just have to go out and, and execute and not worry about what, what he's going to do, essentially. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you make a good pitch and he gets it, then you just got to tip your hat to him. I mean, he's a, he's a great hitter, and, uh, you know, if he gets a, he gets a good pitch, uh, you know, one of your good pitches and hits it, and I mean, there's nothing you can do. I was talking on the other night about you and Zach and your, your your similarities and then your differences, right? And you were telling me how you like to go and you like to talk to guys during the game. What conversations did you bring up tonight on the bench? I didn't have many tonight, um, and I was struggling. I got up there and pitch count early, um, you know, so I was I was kind of just trying to stay a little more focused tonight because I was having a hard time finding the strike zone. I had a lot of uh, three-two counts and. Got my pitch count up early, so I, I kind of stayed away from people tonight. Yeah. Wait, wait. Before we let you go, what has been, what has been the most fun about this for you, Jake? You know, what has been the what has been the thing you've enjoyed the most about this season so far? Um, you know, this is what everybody uh, who plays the game dream where they dream of being, and just being in a big league clubhouse and being able to put the uniform on every day and go out there and, and pitch and do what you know I wanted to do ever since I was little is just a dream come true. So I, know, I really enjoyed that. And what's important for you to do this final month of the season? Um, I think just have fun and just, uh, you know, keep going out there and going after guys and uh, don't try to be too fine and just uh, attack the hitters. It's been fun watching. Good luck. Hopefully the Mets can secure this victory for you, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you very much. Jacob DeGrom, guys, another fine outing. Let's go back upstairs to you with Carlisle on the mound. All right. Thanks very much, Kevin, and thanks to Jacob, whose ERA goes down to 2.87, but Buddy Carlisle just saw something happen that never happens, and Eddie Echeverria got a ball over the head of Juan Lagares in center field. Well, that's a couple of hits in this series by Echeverria. has got a triple now, a double. So the tying run at second with one out. Jordani Valdespin had been on deck to pinch hit, but with a runner in scoring position, Mike Redmond changes his mind and sends up Reed Johnson instead. So instead of the former Met, it's the Met killer, Johnson, who has had couple of at bats in this series and a sacrifice fly in yesterday's game lifetime 330 hitter against the Mets and he bats with the tying run in scoring position and one out. Well that was great of Jacob to, to talk with us and the other inspiration for him in September to finish strong is the rookie of the year you only get one chance at that. Well he certainly has got the credentials he's got a chance for a win today but regardless of that. ZRA is down to 2.87 through 19 starts. That's uh, those are impressive numbers for for any rookie pitcher like Dunn up at the bullpen for Miami. And um, now he gets to watch from the dugout for three games over the weekend against maybe his prime competition for rookie of the year. The Reds Billy Hamilton Johnson trying to bunt his way on that's a strange play. You got the tying run at second base and one out, and you're punting for a hit. Man, I, don't, I don't like that play. David was playing all the way back, so he's giving it to him, but still. Carlos Torres quickly to work alongside Dario Alvarez in the Mets bullpen. Alvarez, the lefty, up from double A, waiting to pitch in his first big league game. And maybe Christian Yelich will be his man. Yelich on deck. After that, you got all right hand hitters. 0 oh, 1 to Johnson with Echeverria at second and one out. And Carlisle throws a fastball by him. 0 oh, 2. That's the one thing that Carlisle has shown since coming up, even 
the veteran that he is, he's shown a very live fastball. Here's Yelich, the on deck batter. The Mets two runs, five hits. The Marlins one run and seven hits. DeGrom was able to sidestep trouble in each of the first three innings tonight. Carlisle trying to do the same. Duda unable to handle the ground to recover as Carlisle to the bag in time for the out. Uh, Duda, who's had a rough night in the field, that time able to recover in time to get the second out. Boy, that was a beautiful play. After kicking it here, he leads Carlisle perfectly to the bag. And good hustle by Buddy to stay with it and get over there in time to get Johnson. And he did get him. Echeverry at a third on the play, but there's a big second out. And now Terry Collins wants the lefty. So Dario Alvarez is going to make his major league debut. He'll come in to face Christian Yelich with the tying run at third and two out of the seventh. So Alvarez, for the first time, will stride to a big league mound. Call to the bullpen brought to you by Verizon. We'll be right back to Miami. season this year. Pitched at three different levels in the Mets farm system. Christian Yelich the first man he'll face with Echeverria the tying run at third and two out in a two to one game in the seventh. And Yelich takes it high for ball one. Alvarez pitched for Savannah St. Lucie and Binghamton 73 innings 48 hits 17 walks and 114 strikeouts. Crazy numbers. And Yelich hits a line drive into right field for a base hit that'll tie the game. So Alvarez's second pitch in the big leagues, a slider that Yelich bangs into right. And Jacob DeGrom's chance for a win is gone as the Marlins tie the game at two. So Terry Collins took a shot with the first timer. Alvarez unable to get the job done. And so he'll exit and the Mets will bring in the right hander. Carlos Torres will come in to face Donovan Solano. Call to the bullpen brought to you by Wise. 2 2 in the seventh. We'll be right back.
Great day. Yeah, puts two innings on Monday, an inning yesterday's ball game. Faces Donovan Solano with Yelich at first, a two out, 2-2 two -two game in the seventh. Solano one for two and a walk. Yelich 16 stolen bases this year, so Torres, Torres will keep a close eye. I'd be very surprised if Yelich is not running here early in the count. Yelich with his second hit of the day, spoiling Dario Alvarez's first big league game. Solano pops one up. Herrera with the angle makes the call and the catch, and that retires the side. Well, the Marlins get even on Yelich's two out hits after seven Mets two. Marlins two. Dealer. Visit CadillacTriState.com to search for local offers and to find a local dealer near you. By Pepsi. For more of MLB's most thrilling moments, check out MLB.com slash Pepsi. And by Cure Auto Insurance. Rates should be based on how you drive, not your credit score. Cure Auto Insurance. Drive well. Eighth inning. The veteran Mike Dunn makes his second appearance in this series for the Marlins. Well, he pitched on Monday the... Labor Day game in the afternoon. This is Verizon Files numbers. Lots of wins for Mr. Dunn. Right place, right time right. for those relief pitchers. What did Elroy face win? 18 games for the 1960 Pirates. Right. Roger McDowell had 14. 14 and 22 saves. To the 86 Mets. Matt Dendecker dragging a bunt. Solano behind the back can't get it there, and Dendecker has a bunt hit. His third hit of the night. Perfectly executed drag bunt from Matt Dendeck. Boy, that was nice to watch. Brings it with him because left-handed pitcher you're hitting against, he's not going to ever get there. And you want the second baseman to field this baseball. That gives you the best chance to have a hit. How about the effort by Solano trying to go behind the back? Not quite. <laughs> so the Mets have the tie-breaking run at first with nobody out. Ben Decker having himself quite a series and six hits and 11 at bats. Now David Wright has been up three times tonight and struck out all three after a three RBI night last night. And David takes a fastball strike from Dunn. David is just one for six in his career against Mike Dunn. Dunn worked on Monday, got a couple of strikeouts, including one of right, then gave up a couple of hits before working out of a jam. And a 
foul tip. 0 and 2. Tom Kohler went seven, allowed two runs and five hits. He walked four and struck out a career high ten. Gave up the home run to Neuenheis. The only blot on his resume. Marlins got Kohler off the hook by tying the game in the bottom of the seventh. And now it's in the hands of the bullpens. 0 2. And right fouls off the fastball at 95. Time to present our Verizon trivia question. Which Marlins players have the most home runs all time against the Mets? As a Marlin against the Mets. Most home runs. Okay. You know who I think it is. Did he play for the Mets later? Not the guy I'm thinking of. Okay. That might be the guy. <laughs> but I'm thinking of a guy who played for the Braves later. Yes. Okay. Lucas Duda waits on deck. Done ahead on right one and two. Dan Decker good speed at first five steals this year. And right takes one foul off to the right. That's a good time to have that trivia question because with Stanton here in right field he's a He'll well, be off that list at some point. Well, if he stays here, yes, beyond the next two seasons, which is when he would hit free agency, he's got 15 against the Mets now, including two in this series. And uh, by the way, he leads off in the bottom of the eighth inning, so plan to go for a snack. You might want to wait. Done ahead, one and two. And David fouls off another one. 96 that time from Dunn. And that, my friends, brings us to our Cholula. Flamethrower from Mike Dunn at 96. Been waiting all night for that 96. I think if you want to achieve green pepper sauce status, you got to get it to 98. <laughs> Seventh pitch of the at bat coming to right. David takes low and in. So better at bat for David than his first three of this game. David said after the game yesterday, it's nice to feel dangerous again. Oh, great line. We'd like to be dangerous to Mr. Dunn right now. Dan Decker at first and nobody out. 2 2. And David goes down swinging. The dreaded golden sombrero for David Wright. Fourth strike out of the night. Well done, did a nice job of throwing so many fastballs at once he threw that slider. David had no chance. So now one out and one on. Lucas Duda coming up, and we'll see how the Marlins position their infield. Casey McGee is going to overlap and go over on the right side. So they got the full shift on in a double play situation. Well, it's, it's an interesting shift because McGee came in and talked to Mike Dunn, probably telling him if there's a pop up on the left side, make sure you're there. Or if Den Decker steals the base, you've got to go cover third. Ronnie, against the lefty, wouldn't you just take the bunt hit if you can? Yeah. Get that go ahead run into scoring position? I think what you're thinking here for your, if you're Duda is that you hit one out of the ballpark, put your team up by a couple of runs. But how often has he done that against yeah. left hand pitching? He's only hit one home run against the lefty all year. And he's been struggling lately. I would think if you're ever going to take that hit that they're giving yep. you on the left side, that now would be the time. With Darno on deck. But he hits one into right field instead for a base hit. So Duda knew what he was doing. A hard hit single for Lucas. Den Decker now at second. For Duda, just his fifth hit in his last 34 at bats. Like a little cutter away from Duda. No shift's going to make that play. So now a base hit could give the Mets the lead with Travis Darno coming up and Mike Redman on his way out to the mound. He's got a right hander ready in the bullpen. Dunn has faced three batters, gave up the bunt hit to Dendecker, struck out right after a long battle, but then gave up the hit to Duda. 
And now Dunn will take his exit and they'll bring in the right hander to face Darno. 2 2 game in the eighth. We'll be right back. Mets will spend the weekend in Cincinnati to play the vastly disappointing Reds. Mets haven't seen the Reds since April, where the Mets took two out of three from Cincinnati. Mets will be a great American ballpark Friday night to open up the series with Bartolo Colon on the mound against the all star Alfredo Simon, who was the only Red to beat the Mets in that series back in April. Dylan G and Johnny Cueto Saturday afternoon, Zach Wheeler and Matt Latos on Sunday. Still no Joey Votto. He's been out for more than two months now. With the um, quad slash knee injury, and he's had another setback this week. Yeah. He may not come back at all this year. Yeah, they, they're kind of just shutting him down. Well, Brian Morris was acquired from Pittsburgh, and he's been about as good as you can be after the trade. Came over from Pittsburgh and has given up virtually nothing. He's been out for 10 days, though, with a groin injury. This is his first time back on the mound. He faces Darno with two men on. Tie game eighth inning. Travis 0 for 2 in a walk tonight. And goes after that first pitch cutter, nothing and one. Darno struck out of the first, walked and scored in front of Neuenheis' home run of the fourth for the Mets' only two runs. Then had a comebacker into a double play in the sixth. Den Decker at second, Duda at first with one out. Line the other way, and Darno has himself a base hit, and that'll give the Mets the lead. Dendecker in to score. Duda goes to third. It'll be held up there. Travis Darno with an opposite field double to get the lead run home, and the Mets go in front three to two. Well, nice inning here for the Mets. Dendecker starting it with a bunt base hit, and nice hitting by Darno. Breaking ball, missed the first one, second one line into right field. Stanton fell trying to throw that ball in, but still got it to the cutoff man. With Darno having himself quite a series. Six hits and 11 at bats. That RBI double puts the Mets back in front. Now they'll intentionally walk Newenice, who hit a massive two run homer back in the fourth inning. So Newenice will be on base for the fourth straight time. His third walk of the night. And the Mets will have the bases loaded for Dilson Herrera. So Morris returning to action after 10 days on the sidelines with a groin injury, and he's greeted rudely. Talking about Cincinnati coming up this weekend, the Reds are getting walloped again tonight by the Orioles. 
six nothing in the ninth. If they lose that game, Cincinnati will be 15 and 29 since the All Star break. Otto has missed considerable time. Phillips was out for a while and hasn't hit since coming back. But the biggest disappointment of all for the Reds has been Jay Bruce. Bruce had a grand slam last night, but he's hitting 219 coming into today. After one of his best seasons last year, and that's a team that went to the postseason two years in a row. Their best player this year, Todd Frazier, made the All Star team, but Devin Mezzarocco, their catcher, has had a breakout season. 891 OPS coming into today. That's outstanding. Here's Herrera, who struck out three times tonight. A chance to expand the Mets' lead. Bases loaded, one out. And he takes the pitch down for ball one. Herrera, two for 12 in this series, had the great game on Monday with a triple and a home run, but 0 for 5 last night and the three strikeouts today. Due to Darno and New and high support for him. Each team now with eight hits. And Herrera hits one back toward the middle. Echeverry with a beautiful stop gets the force, but not the double play as a run comes home. Echeverry had taken a base hit away from Herrera. And a nice effort by Solano on the turn, but Herrera fast enough to beat it out as Duda comes home to make it four to two. Well, first, nice play by Echeverria. Gets it to Solano. Hard slide by Neuenheis. Solano's been a pincushion out there for Mets sliders. Well, they're base runners. And good speed by Herrera. So Herrera gets the RBI, his fourth in this series, and his fifth in the first six games of his career. Sparkling effort by Echeverria, who was really, I mean, he gets lost behind. Andrews and Simmons because they play in the same division, but he is just a terrific defensive shortstop. So now two runs home in the inning. First and third and two out. That's with a four to two lead. And here's Tejada. Ruben is one for three. He doubled back in the fifth. That's the third time in this series, Newland Heiss, Den Decker, and Lagaris, that they've gone in really hard at second base. It's great to see. Yeah. Herrera has yet to attempt a stolen base. At 23 in the minor leagues this year. And Tejada takes a strike. Curtis Granderson has come out on deck to pinch hit if Tejada keeps the inning going. Lewin Heist just got in and caught that front foot of Solano. Equally good by Solano to stay in there. Went off his leg. Nothing at two. Well, the inning began with a drag bunt single by Matt Dendecker. There's Granderson on deck. Duda with a one out hit. And then Morris came in, and Darno took one the other way for a double to drive in the go ahead run. An intentional walk to Newenheis. And then a run scoring on the fielder's choice to make it four to two. That's are not going to use Jerry's familiar tonight, so it's Dana Eveland up. Getting ready to pitch in the bottom of the eighth. Unless the Mets don't need to pitch it, in which case Torres could start the inning. But you would figure with the right hand hitters coming up, Stanton will lead off. And the extra run of this inning has created a situation where Stanton can't tie the game. And that obviously is huge when you're playing this Miami team. And Morris checking in again on Herrera. Stanton, McGee, and Ozuna, the three right hand batters, do up. First game of this series, Mets had a runner on first, runner on third, and stole second, and the Marlins didn't have a defense for it. Of course, they did ran a delayed double steal and got a run against the Phillies over the weekend. There goes Herrera. The pitch inside and hit Tejada, and that'll load the bases. Now the Mets may have been planning a delayed double steal, but instead Tejada gets drilled by the pitch. That was a slider that just backed up and caught him right on the left hand. 
Ray Rivera is the trainer. Terry Collins will both come out and have a look. While they do, we'll check in with the studio. C.J. Papa has a game break. Brought to you by the New York State Smokers Quit Line. All right, CJ, it's feeling as though the Brewers may never win again. Seven straight losses in danger of their eighth. Now, it appears as though Terry Collins only had Granderson in the on deck circle as a decoy. Tejada getting hit by the pitch, loaded the bases, but Torres is going to bat for himself. And as we mentioned, the, the Marlins have the right hand hitters coming up. The Mets don't have Familia available tonight, so rather than leave themselves short, they'll let Torres swing the bat. Carlos is 0 for 4 at the plate this year, and he bats with the bases loaded and two out. Two runs home here in the eighth inning. And he takes inside ball one. You've got a struggling pitcher on the mound who hasn't pitched in 10 days. So there's a tough call for a manager. Do you go for the kill with a pinch hitter? Or do you do what's necessary to set up your bullpen for the last two innings? I mean the siren song is familiar and using him a fourth straight day but you, you can't do that and be responsible. No and uh, and I, I, I like this move uh, it'd be different if Granderson was red hot and you're maybe assured of a, an extra base hit he's not. And Morris misses inside two and one. You wouldn't have to use Granderson in that spot. Yeah. You could use Eric Campbell. Right. You could use Wilmer Flores. Even Eric Young. But I think the uh, the imperative of having the right arm in the bullpen to face Stanton was more important. Two one coming, and Torres swings and fouls one back. Leaf pitchers, their at bats are so few and far between. They can mostly go a whole season without getting an at bat. Three for 32 in his career with two runs batted in. Darno, Herrera, and Tejada, the base runners, with two out. Torres, the eighth man to bat in the inning. 2 2 coming. Strike three called, and the inning comes to an end. But the Mets grab the lead against the Marlins' bullpen in the eighth inning. Two men aboard, Travis Darno greets Brian Morris with the opposite field double. That brings in the lead run. Herrera beats out the double play, and that brings in another. 4 2 New York going to the bottom of the eighth.
Friday night, the Mets will return to action at Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati for the first of three with the Reds. Our coverage begins at 6 o'clock Friday night on SNY. Bartolo Colon against Alfredo Simon in the opening game of that series. Well, Giancarlo Stanton comes to the plate, leading off at the bottom of the eighth, and the Mets now with a two run lead, which makes this at bat a little bit more comfortable for the Mets to absorb. Carlos Torres, who got the final out of the seventh, stays in after taking the turn at bat, gets the fastball in for a strike. If there is such a thing as a comfortable going up against Stanton, well, at least you know if he hits it 500 feet, you still have the lead. Casey McGee on deck, and then Marcelo Zuna in the bottom of the eighth. What you plan for, if you're the Mets, is for this to be Stanton's last at bat of the game. If he comes up again, then you got a problem. Yeah, then you got a big problem. <laughs> Torres got Stanton to fly to center in last night's game. He got him to foul out to left on Monday. And that one drilled deep down the left field line, right toward the pole, and it's out of here. John Carlos Stanton does it again. He's homered in all three games of this series. His 36th of the year. That one a laser beam into the seats and left. And it cuts the men lead to four to three. I do have to say, all the years doing this, this is one of the most impressive displays of power I've seen in a long time. Well, first the pitch, a hanging cutter. Oh, hanging curveball, sorry. It was just whether it's going to be fair or foul. When he gets that ball so hard into the stands that you got to get out of the way. He is a unique talent that at age 24 he's only going to get better. It's Casey McGee in what's now a one run game. Even in slow mo, his bat speed is fast. Yikes. Casey McGee hits one on the ground. Tejada slides over to get it. And that's the first out of the inning. So one out and nobody on. Torres fearing just fine against the Portals. So Zuna, who's 0 for 3, last time up, hit one wide of third. David Wright made a tremendous play, a spinning throw to first. Azuna was first ruled safe. Mets challenged, won the challenge, and the call was overturned. That helped Jacob DeGrom get through six. DeGrom allowed one run and six hits tonight. It'll be a no decision game for him. Buddy Carlisle went two thirds of an inning, was charged with a run. Dario Alvarez faced one batter in his big league debut, gave up the tying hit before Torres got the final out of the seventh. Let's grab the lead at the top of the eighth, and then Stanton cut that lead in half. So Stanton now with 36 home runs, 102 RBIs. He's only the second Marlin ever to have a season of as many as 35 homers and 100 RBIs. The only other Marlin to do that was Gary Sheffield back in '96. Sheffield had a 46, a 42 and 120 year for the Marlins in '96. He's still got three and a half weeks to go. Two one coming. Ozuna lines one at Duda, able to make the grab for the second out. Duda's looked off balance all night, covering first base, catching that line drive, but able to stay with that one. I mean, this ball hit right on the nose. I don't think Duda was sure whether that was going to bounce or he's going to be able to catch it in the air. He was able to catch it in the air. So a hard out. Off the bat of Ozuna, two down in the inning, and now Garrett Jones. Mets have the left-hander. Evelyn was ready in the bullpen, but looks like they're sticking with Torres to pitch to Jones, who's 0 for 3 tonight. Interesting. Darno told Duda to move closer to the line. Makes sense. One-run game. Well, especially with all the cutters that Torres throws. Lucas uh, first base just taking away the double. And Jones chops one to the right side. 
Herrera makes the play side retired. So Stanton hits his third home run of the series. But the Mets emerged the eighth inning with the lead. A bullet off the bat of Stanton for his 36th. Mets with a one run lead as we head to the ninth in Miami. We asked you which Marlins players hit the most home runs against the Mets. I thought Dan Ugla, but mm -hmm. it's not. It's not the guy you thought it was either. No. It was a guy who was a Met before he was a Marlin. Preston Wilson. Chris Hatcher will pitch the top of the ninth for Miami. Well, Hatcher was called up at the end of May, May 22nd, appears, has appeared in 41 games for the Marlins this season. Juan Lagares won for four tonight. Single to center back in the first inning. Mets at second and third. Nobody out of the first. Tom Kohler got out of that and pitched very well for seven innings. Gave up just a Kirk Neuenheis two run homer on a night when the Marlins needed him to pitch deep into the game after seeing their starters go two and a third and three innings in the first two games of the series. Hatcher has been a strikeout machine this year. 49 strikeouts, only eight walks. Still has that uh, that catcher's delivery, doesn't he? Another one of those guys that turned from catching to relief pitching, like Jason Mott. It's had a guy like that who also pitched for the Marlins, Henry Owens. That's right. Too hard too. Lagaris, Dendecker, and Wright as the Mets look for some insurance in the ninth. It's got two in the eighth, both runs charged to Mike Dunn. Darno with the go ahead hit, and the Mets able to scratch out another. That's poked into left field, and Lagaris has his second hit of the night. So after a four hit night last night, Lagaris with his second hit in this game. Well, breaking pitch that doesn't break stays on the inside part, jams Lagaris just enough. Is a place that you could play for one run if you wanted to, or have Lagara steal a base. Lagaris with five steals in his last five games, and 
Den Decker takes it outside. Den Decker's had a big night, three for four. It doubled back in the first, single to center in the fifth, then had a beautiful drag bunt single in the eighth. David Wright, who has already struck out four times in this game, waiting on deck. Third baseman McGee playing well in at third, thinking bunt. Well, in this series, you've seen Terry Collins has not gone for the bunt when you have seen him use it the first five months of this season. Mm -hmm. A little more aggressive, letting his hitters hit. Just foul. Jones barely got off the bag, so if it had been fair, he probably would have made the play. Where there has not been a stolen base with Hatcher on the mound this year. He's done that good a job holding runners. I mean, Keith would chastise him for not coming off the line, right? But that's not Jones's game. No. It's funny, Hatcher, a former catcher, knows what it feel, feels like not to have a pitcher hold a runner on. Knows how to help his catchers out. One and one to Dendecker. And Matt takes low and in. 96 from Hatcher. Two and one. The Mets four runs, nine hits. The Marlins three runs, nine hits. The Mets were down one nothing, up two to one. Marlins tied it in the seventh. The Mets took the lead in the top of the eighth. Stanton's home run made it a one run game in the bottom of the eighth. A little hit and run here, maybe, Gary? Got a pitcher who throws strikes. It would be the right time for it. Henry Mejia getting ready for the save opportunity. Marlins will have the lower third of their order due up. Sultan Lamakia, Echeverria, and the pitcher's spot. You might want to note that Stanton is due up sixth in the inning. Last night he was due up fifth, and he never got to the plate in the night. As Mejia registered his 22nd save, working a 1-2-3 inning. Gave him a two run lead to work with last night. They'd love to do the same tonight. Two and one to Dan Decker. And he takes a strike. Two and two. Figure Lagaris will run here, three and two, and nobody out. And Hatcher keeping a close close eye. Got a quick move, the right-hander. Not going. And then Decker fouls back the fastball. Maybe that comes from the stat we gave before that doesn't walk anybody. He's, he's had a lot of strikeouts in his appearances. Coming up tonight after the post game, it's Kareth Burke with Geico Sports Night. Stephen Hill gone, leaving a trail behind him. <laughs> no loss. Three and two to Den Decker. Lagares runs this time and it's low ball four and the Mets have the first two men on in the ninth. The sixth walk given up by Miami pitching tonight another terrific at bat for Dendecker who's on base for the fourth time tonight. Boy, he's had a very impressive last week. You know he came up red hot and then he cooled down for about two weeks but now this last week Dendecker all of a sudden back to where he was when he first arrived. Well it's interesting the California guys when they went on the California <laughs> trip got hot maybe he's hot here in Florida. Well, 
night when the Florida native DeGrom started and pitched well again against Miami. So here's David Wright, who has already had the golden sombrero tonight, four strikeouts and four at bats. Lagaris at second, Den Decker at first, and David takes a strike. Now, five strikeouts in a game has only happened five times in Mets history, and it hasn't happened in 21 years. The last Met to strike out five times in the game was Ryan Thompson in 1993. David trying to avoid that fate. He loops one into right field. Stanton coming on. And he's got it for the first down. Just for reference, the other Mets to strike out five times in a game. Ron Swoboda twice. Frank Tavares. Little guy. Yeah. And Dave King. That one you think. King. Yeah. And Wright avoids joining their company. One out. Here's Duda. Who had a base hit to right field against the left hander Dunn that helped fuel that two run rally for the Mets in the eighth. Lucas one for three and a walk tonight. Now facing Hatcher with two on and one out. Have had some chances today, haven't they? Starting from the first inning when they had second and third and no out. That's have left eight runners on base. No sunflower seeds for David. Off the corner to Duda, want to know. Well, Duda's had two career at bats against Hatcher. He's two for two with a home run. That's looking to open up some breathing room here in the ninth. Good speed on the bases. Lagaris at second, Den Decker at first. Darno, who had the go ahead hit, waiting on deck. And now Hatcher falls behind on Duda, 2 0. Cleveland shut out Detroit tonight, 7 0. Danny Salazar went the distance and didn't walk about it. He's their young right hander who can throw 100 miles an hour. Beat Justin Verlander, falls to 12 and 12. So if Kansas City loses tonight, Cleveland will be only four and a half out in that AL Central. I don't know how they do it. 2 0. Swing and a miss. Off speed pitch from Hatcher, 2 and 1. I mean, right. they've got Corey Kluber has yeah. had a great year, but I mean, for that team to be five games over 500 is. Uh, it's a real tribute to their manager. Yeah, they have an exceptional manager, in Frank Kona. You mean when Michael Brantley and Carlos Santana are your best players? Kipnis was not having the same year he did the year before. Another well, off-speed pitch from Hatcher, and it's two and two. Here, he's had a lot of time to get ready with this long inning. Two and two to Duda with two men on, and Lucas goes down swinging. So after falling behind, Hatcher threw nothing but off-speed stuff, and he has the second out. Well, we've seen this in that series against Lucas, just plenty of. Change-ups and curveballs to him from these Marlins pitchers. That is 13 strikeouts for Marlins pitchers tonight. The Mets are now one for ten with runners in scoring position. Travis Darno had the big hit in the eighth inning with two on and one out. He laced one the other way for a double to drive in the go-ahead run. And now looking to get some insurance home here in the ninth. Lagaris led off with a base hit. Dendecker walked. They've remained. Right where they are after right flied out due to struck out. Now it's Darno. And he takes the breaking ball in the dirt for ball one. One thing that Darno has gotten better at, Gary, after coming back from Vegas, he's done a lot better job hitting the breaking ball. We talked so much before he went down about his inability to handle the pitch outside. We're seeing him drive the ball to right field now on that pitch away. Pops this one up into shallow center. 
And Chavarria takes charge, and the inning is over. So the Mets strand two more. So Mejia will have just the one run lead to work with as he comes on for the bottom of the ninth. Last night, going for number 23 tonight. Yeah, his last four appearances have been save appearances for Henry. He's really taken to this closer role, hasn't he? He's got the lower third of the order coming up in the bottom of the ninth. So for Lamakia, Echeverria at the pitcher's spot, which means I get uh, to see Jordani Valdespin in this inning. He's had a knack against closers. Interesting, before all of these games, how what do you say? How friendly the Mets players were with Valdespin. You never felt like, or you heard a lot of stories that they didn't particularly like him that much, but they, every, everyone was giving him a hug, handshake. I mean, I was very surprised by him, to tell you the truth. As um, as Ricky Henderson once eloquently said, he probably, the Mets were probably letting bye byes be bye byes. <laughs> 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 That's Ricky. <laughs> Jared Saltalamakia leads off in the last of the ninth. Saltalamakia one for three, doubled back in the second inning against Jacob DeGrom. Carlos Torres is pitcher of record on the long side for the Mets. Got the last out in the seventh. Mets took the lead in the eighth. Torres gave up a home run to Stanton in the bottom of the eighth, but then got the next three hitters and leaves it in the capable hands of Mejia for the ninth. Echeverria on deck. 1 0 to Salt of Lamakia. The Browns went down to first to foul ball. 1 and 1. DeGrom went six, a lot of run on six hits. Buddy Carlisle, two thirds of an inning, one run, one hit. Dario Alvarez in his big league debut gave up a hit to the only man he faced. And then Torres, an inning and a third, one run, one hit. So the Mets trying to figure out a way to get through the late innings without Jerry's Familia, who has been such a big part of. The formula, but has pitched three straight days and is off limits tonight. So far, so good. Two and one to Salt of the Mafia. Now, for uh, for the Marlins to get Stanton to the plate here in the ninth, they would have to get three men on. He is the sixth man due up, and it's Mike Redmond's job to figure out how to make that happen. Last night he was left on the bench in the ninth inning. Now Mejia behind on Salt Lamaki at three and one. Last night Mejia worked a one, two, three, nine, two strikeouts and a ground ball with a two run lead. Salt of 
Mafia has some power, especially the left center on the left side. 0 for 3 in his career against Mejia. Henry behind 3 and 1. And he walked him. So a leadoff walk to Salt of Lamakia. We'll probably see a pinch runner here with the tying run aboard. One thing you can expect more and more in September with the rosters expanded. Late inning pinch runners. And it's going to be Kiki Hernandez, who is a September call up. He was with the Astros and the Marlins earlier this year. And it's Hernandez to run. Sounds like a fast name. Kiki. Boy, Echeverria's had a nice series, hasn't he, defensively and offensively? Well, let's see if they let him swing the bat or whether he's asked to bunt that tying run over. David Wright playing even with the bag at third. Echeverria double his last time up, and he does square, but he bunts it foul. It's not Valdespin, it's Jeff Baker who's come out on deck to pinch hit. Well, I think if you're David here, you gotta come in a little more and take kind of the bunt out of the hands of Mejia. He doesn't like firing the ball around the bases either. Echeverria has four sacrifices this year. And he bunts it foul again, and it's 0 2. So if you're Mike Redmond, you leave the bunt on. Usually, with uh, your everyday players, you do not. Brett Butler giving the signs down to third base. Echeverria has grounded into 17 double plays this year, which I think is one of the reasons you bunt him in this spot. But now it's 0 2. And he hits a double play ball right at Herrera. Tejada with the turn. 4 6 3 double play. And the Marlins are down to their final out of the night. Third double play for the Mets infield tonight. Did you will that so, Gary? Nice call on the double play. Nice hands by Herrera. And Tejada, an easy throw to first base. That's so Echeverria unable to get the bunt down. And that proves to be huge. Get any worse than that if you're a player. Can't, can't get the bunt down and into a double play. So now Jeff Baker, who started at first base yesterday and went one for three. Two out and nobody on. Four three New York last of the night. Hey. And breaking ball in for a strike. I find it a little puzzling that it's Baker and not yeah. Valdespin. Me too. Got a history of late inning pitch hit home run. Certainly that was his calling card as a man. Strike two. So now the Marlins are down to their final strike. Two to Jeff Baker. He struck him out, and the ball game is over. Henry Mejia fans Baker to end it, and the Mets take two out of three in Miami. Travis Darno with the big hit in the eighth inning. The Mets survive another Giancarlo Stanton home run, and they win a one-run game from the Marlins, four-three in the final. Well, the Mets now are nine and six on rubber games in this third game here. Mejia with his 23rd save and great. Offensive games from Kirk Neuenheis, who had three walks and a home run, that long home run, and Matt Dendecker, who had three hits in the ball game. Dendecker on base four times. Neuenheis hit one to the upper deck in right center. Six good innings from Jacob DeGrom as he allowed just one run and lowered his ERA to 